We'll just move right along. Uh, we have a half hour keynote before lunch, and uh, that is from. I'll make sure I'm looking at the right one. I don't understand the wrong one. Oh, yeah, this one is our regulatory fraud, privacy, and legal brief. Our presenter is Jacqueline Shinnefield, and she will be presenting. And then we'll have some announcements just before lunch, so don't go anywhere quite yet. Come on up, Jack. I didn't prearrange a bench, so I hope I'm not too short as usual. But so I don't know how many of you were at the last event where I did a legal uh, update. So I'm going to try not to repeat what I already spoke about in March and just talk about new and exciting things. And actually, the last speech and topic is a perfect segue into what's new in the Canadian world. Um, because there was a new anti-money laundering um, amendment announced recently, uh, Bill C-31, and it was announced in Canada specifically to deal with digital currencies like Bitcoin. And what happened was you had players of the, um, in the Bitcoin space, and they sort of were trying to determine if, like the U.S., they were going to be subject to money services business legislation. So in the U.S., once Bitcoin took off, uh, FinCEN issued um, advisories that said, you know what, we think if you're doing this and you're trading in Bitcoin and you're an exchanger, you're a money services business and you need to be registered. And so a lot of the, you know, the entities that were involved in the business came to FinTrack, which is Canada's equivalent to FinCEN, and said, do we need to be registered? And uh, FinTrack basically, depending on the model and what you're doing, looked at the legislation, looked at the wording of the legislation, and a money services business is someone who remits or transmits funds. And the term funds is actually defined in the law as legal currency and tender. And so they had to conclude, based on the wording of the legislation, that our money laundering legislation was not broad enough to catch digital currencies. So basically, all Bitcoin and digital transactions were completely unregulated from an AML perspective. And this was seen as a very high risk to the Department of Finance. And so they got together rather quickly, did a bunch of consultations, and came out with uh, Bill C-31 that specifically regulates digital currencies. I, and I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly, but the one thing I would say from a Canadian perspective is that the biggest challenge is that those involved in the digital currency space, it's very difficult to get a bank account. So try to find a bank that's going to bank you when you're carrying on a Bitcoin type of business. They're going to say your transactions are anonymous, and even though there's a Bitcoin ledger, etc., they're going to say your transactions are anonymous, you don't have a regulated product, there's no one that's supervising you or watching you, and we're not going to open a bank account for you. So the challenge Challenges aren't so much complying with the regulations. Hopefully those will be um, something that can easily be complied with. The government is consulting with players in the space to understand what they can and can't regulate to make the legislation work effectively. The biggest challenge is trying to get banks to bank you. And hopefully for those players in the industry, this amendment that covers uh, digital currency will be helpful. So what, what does it do? So it definitely expands the definition of a money service business to deal with uh, entities that are dealing in virtual currencies. And we don't know what dealing in virtual currencies means. It's going to be defined in the regulations, and we'll just have to wait for those. The other thing that's really interesting is, in the past, when you went to FinTrack, if you had a money services business, and you were trying to determine whether you were caught by the Canadian legislation or not, and you carried on your business from the US, they would do an examination of whether or not you were carrying on business in Canada. And they distinguished between carrying on business in Canada and carrying on business with Canadians. And just because you carry on business with Canadians doesn't mean you're carrying on business in Canada. And they would look at things like, do you have a bank account? here? Do you have agents here? Do you have computer servers here? Um, and they would sort of look at your whole, you know, do you market to Canadians? And they would look at your whole business model and decide whether or not the Canadian legislation applied to you. And I've had circumstances where they've said it doesn't. You're not carrying on business here. You're not subject to the rules. And that's changed. So under the new definition of a money services business, they've now included um, entities that carry on business on a cross-border basis. So that's a different change from the Canadian regime. 
Um, in the new bill dealing with anti-money laundering, as I, there's a broad regulation making power. So it says that they have the ability to make regulations to add other services to the definition of money services businesses. And so if anyone's following AML legislation in Canada closely, in December of 2011 was the first time that the government proposed regulating prepaid cards as a form of uh, prepaid access product. And the way that the legislation is drafted, it'd be really easy to define prepaid cards as a money services business and put it in the regulations. And it's much easier to get regulations put into force than, than the actual act itself. So that's just something that I would say, let's stay tuned. So that's sort of what's new in the AML world. Um, I thought we'd talk for a minute about the prepaid card regulation, the federal one. When we spoke about it in March last time, it wasn't in force, and now May 1st has passed, and welcome, here we are. Um, there's been a lot of issues with this legislation, specifically because it is not, it's meant to be consumer protection legislation, that's really clear. However, they didn't draft it that way. They drafted it very broadly, and it technically applies to corporate programs, commercial programs, and there's really been a lot of uncertainty because it uses wording like when the card holder, when the product holder, things can expire, they can't expire, you need consent, and when you're dealing with corporate programs, it's like, well, whose consent do you need? Do you need the consumer's consent? Do you need the company's consent? And there's just been a lot of uncertainty. Um, and so there is going to be guidance that's going to be issued by the FCAC shortly that's going to deal with who falls into what category for the for the corporate commercial cards. So right now, um, the regulations um, that govern, govern commercial card programs um, have specific provisions that deal with promotional products. And a promotional product, I have the definition up there, which is a promotional loyalty or reward program. But that, you know, when you're dealing with corporate programs, you're dealing with employee programs, incentive programs, it doesn't always fall within in that basket. So where you do have a promotional product that does fall in that basket, so even if it's a corporate card program, you still have to disclose charges, your terms and conditions, how the person can verify balances, information on split payments, uh, your name of your issuer, toll-free numbers, etc. cetera. Uh, the difference about promotional products is the fees, the right to use the funds on the cards can expire, there's no restrictions, and you can charge maintenance fees on day one without consent. But when you're dealing with a corporate card that's non-promotional, uh, the likely outcome is somewhat different. So because there's a prohibition on expiry of funds, except for promotional cards, if you have a corporate commercial program that's non-promotional, the funds cannot expire. The difference is that the organization gets the funds, not the cardholder. So you, so you have an organization that issues cards, they're the ones that fund it and pay for it. The cards are issued to the cardholders. The cardholders' funds can expire expire, but you cannot take those cards from the organization. The organization still has the right to those cards. Um, in terms of the requirements now under the legislation, when you're dealing with individual cardholders, it says that you cannot charge um, a, a maintenance fee before 12 months unless the card's reloadable and you get express consent of the cardholder. Well, they're saying that still applies in the corporate commercial world, but the consent has to come from the organization as opposed to the cardholder. It's really bizarre, to be honest, but that's how they're interpreting it and that's how they drafted it. And the last provision is in the prepaid regulations, there's a specific provision that prohibits um, adding a new fee or changing fees which are, without getting uh, providing notice to the cardholder and that does not apply um, to corporate commercial cards in the non-promotional context so um, sort of that's going to be coming out there's going to be guidance on that but I just sort of thought I'd give you a heads up um, just, I think, yesterday, uh, the Department of Finance issued guidance uh, dealing with the uh, commitment of the largest banks to offer specific and no card accounts, uh, no cost accounts to vulnerable Canadians, and that's their definition of vulnerable Canadians. Uh, the minimum features are you know, the debit transactions, 12 a month, check writing privileges, uh, no extra charge for deposits, etc. Um, also, check image return or online check viewing, and that's again no charge for vulnerable Canadians, and no charge for monthly printed statements and pre-authorized debits. If you don't qualify in the vulnerable category, there's a low fee option of four dollars, and I I raise that for two reasons. One, you'll see later, and one, it's you know when you think about prepaid cards and and trying to sort of compete with accounts, it, you know, this is a really uh, interesting option from a consumer protection perspective because it's either four dollars or zero dollars with some with some benefits that are available. So I just wanted to raise that for you.
Um, one of the other things that I was asked to speak about was fraud. So I'll just talk about the Digital Privacy Act, which had second reading in May. And I think this is actually for this industry specifically. This is going to be a really important and beneficial amendment to you. So what privacy legislation says right now is that you cannot use or disclose personal information without the person's express consent. So if you don't have consent in a privacy policy saying what you're going to do f with information, you can't use it for that. And the consent has to be reasonable in the circumstances. And you know, everyone's familiar with this. And there are exceptions, you know, for, for law enforcement things, but generally the exceptions are very limited. And one of the exceptions that they have now proposed in the um, in the Digital Privacy Act, which a lot of sort of civil libertarians are complaining about, is there is now going to be an exception that you can disclose information to another organization. So for financial institutions, for businesses, it's not limited to government, it's to another organization where it's reasonable for the purposes of detecting or suppressing fraud or preventing fraud that's likely to be committed. Um, and it's reasonable to expect that if you ask the person for their consent, they'd say no. And this is, this is huge because as many of you know, especially in the prepaid space, there is a lot of fraud. And there's a lot of organizations working towards making products that will sort of be fraud identifiers and fraud database type products. And it's really difficult for them to do that because they have internal challenges of what customer information they have in their possession, who they can share it with, who they can use it. I mean, this gives the ability for organizations to come together and share information and come up with you know more global fraud databases where you get names of people that are sort of known actors and committed in this area. And I think, you know, from a fraud perspective, Perspective. This is something that, going forward, I think you're going to see a lot more products being offered by the transunions and the Equifaxes and the other companies of this world that will hopefully help us in the battle against fraud. So I think this is a huge, uh, a huge good thing for our business. Um, the other thing I just would briefly say in terms of the Digital Privacy Act, there's a couple things that are important from a business perspective. Um, so it used to be we never had an express provision in the legislation that when you en en engaged in a huge business transaction where you were selling a card portfolio or credit card portfolio, there was no exception that you needed, uh, that you did not need consent. And that's always something that we've grappled with. And so there's, in most every privacy policy you look at, there's always a huge section saying, and if we sell our assets, you agree we can disclose. Well, now they've codified the business exemption, so that's helpful. Although I would, my gut is no one's going to take those provisions out of their uh, privacy policies anyway, but now it's codified. You can exchange information in an acquisition context without consent um, as long as you uh, notify the individual within a reasonable time. Um, there's also a, a breach notification requirement coming out in the federal legislation, not new and not surprising. Um, the standard is if it's significant harm and if it causes significant harm, uh, you have to give notice and significant harm would be based on how sensitive the information is and the probability it will be misused. And then there's actually a definition as well, which is um, humiliations, one of them. So I thought, God, does that mean if someone has a database of your weight and that gets disclosed, that would be significant harm because you could suffer humiliation through that one out there. Um, one of the things that I spoke about again in March in detail, I don't want to go, go into a lot of detail, but for those of you that don't know, uh, Canada's anti-spam legislation, which is the most, uh, the toughest anti-spam legislation in the world, is coming into effect on July the 1st. And that legislation basically prohibits you from sending CEMs, commercial electronic messages or emails or phone calls to people unless you have consent. So it has to be an opt-in express consent. And you cannot, after July 1st, send an email asking for express consent. And that's why those of you who are in Canada must be having your mailboxes inundated right now for people asking you for consent to things. It's to deal with this requirement that they're not going to be able to do that. So this is something in terms of your business model. If you're dealing with people um, and you, you want to be able to market to them going forward, uh, if they're not ongoing customers, you need to get their express consent. There are exceptions when the legislation does come in place for ongoing customer relationships. So if you have a relationship with someone, you can market to them, but then there's time limitations on that. So just something to keep in mind in terms of uh, what's new and on the horizon. And the, the last thing I want to talk about, and I want to talk about in a little bit of detail, because I think this is one of those areas that's really brushed over, is that the government in their... Um, 
in their in their December uh, 13th budget and uh, in the February budget that came out they keep talking about a consumer code and we're going to have a consumer code in Canada and the consumer code is going to be principle based regulation and it's going to be principle based because that way it's not drafted so specifically that as new products and services come out uh, it won't quite fit into the mold and it's you know more flexible and more innovative and different things that they talked about uh, when they issued their consultation paper is um, you know we're going to have these standards and the standards are going to be um, supplemented by rules uh, considerations we're going to look at include impact on consumers when you're developing a product so when you're developing marketing and delivering a product you know um, the institutions are going to have to give information to consumers on the benefits rights and features of a product and that goes beyond uh, disclosing borrowing costs and then they talk about possible enhancements to the existing framework, which deals with the duty of fairness and you know requiring institutions to know their customers and I, I you know this was always out there this has been out there for a while but on May 14th um, the, the task force on financial consumer protection the G20 which Canada is a part of actually released a paper it's called draft effective approaches to support the implementation of the remaining G20 OECD high-level principles on financial consumer protection it's a mouthful um, but that is a paper that the Canadian government is clearly looking at that guides what this consumer code can look like and the reason that um, I say the Canadian government is looking at that is one of the provisions that is in that paper deals with opening low-cost bank accounts for vulnerable people and so here you have the principal in this paper and you have the Canadian government announcing it they're going to be looking at this and drafting the code and so I just sort of wanted to share with you um, some of the themes that are in that that paper which may or may not be surprising so the first is the equitable and fair treatment of consumers. So we have to treat consumers equitably, honestly, and fairly. And that would be embedded in all aspects of financial products offered, from advertising, to advice, to responsible business contact, to remuneration, to improve transparency. So there'd be a prohibition on unfair terms and practices, and there would be a suitability requirement. You would have to do an assessment to determine whether or not a product is suitable for your customer. And it would require you to take into account things like their debt obligations, their credit rating, their socioeconomic status, their employment, their income. It takes the AML world of know your customer and adds a whole other level on it, which basically says you should know your customer, you should understand where they're coming from, and you shouldn't be offering them a providing financial services that aren't appropriate to them. So I find that to be a really high standard. Um, so you want to make sure your products are appropriate for your consumers and if it harms a consumer's interest then the regulator can tell you to pull it. Um, so I, I find that that is um, you know going forward people aren't really talking about the consumer code I think that's going to have the most disruptive effect on this industry completely dealing with things that we do in the card industry we're going to have people looking at us um, much more stringently in terms of the fees that are charged are these appropriate products when you're dealing with financial institutions that have obligations to offer uh, low-cost accounts you know should they be counseling people away from prepaid cards uh, towards those accounts given their financial circumstances it's just a completely I just think it can potentially shake things up in a really significant way and uh, we'll wait and hear but I think that's I mean I think that's what's really going to be relevant going forward I don't know when the codes going to be released um, they're having consultations across the country now but that's I think this is significant and it's it's moving towards a duty of fairness to the consumer to the point of institutions can make money but not at the expense of consumer and products have to be fair and reasonable so that's kind of the quick legal update happy to take any questions or talk to anyone after wow I've stunned you into boredom sorry <laughs> Actually, Jackie, I have one. Yep. Um, with regards to social marketing, social media applications, do, do any of these laws kind of fall over to that, or is that up to that? So LinkedIn, for instance, is that up to them to sort of manage the rules and regulations and contact in their community? Yes, it is. Um, it, it, the, in the anti-spam world, um, 
the regulator has said, you know, social media postings on Facebook won't be net caught, won't be considered commercial electronic messages. So you don't have to worry about in, in that space, that's not going to be considered a commercial electronic message if something's posted on Facebook, look at this, look at that. Um, but otherwise, you know, we've given advice to different types of social media on how you comply with advertising requirements and to the extent, you know, that things want to be advertised on Twitter by way of example where you have a, a key space restraint, you're going to have to comply with those requirements. And usually those sorts of organizations when you enter into an agreement to market your products with them they're going to make sure that you're um, covenanting that your ads are compliant with laws and that they have all the required disclosures so they would push the burden to you but those organizations in and of themselves with what they're doing they're responsible for complying Sorry, just a quick question. You talked a little bit about uh, virtual currency and prepaid. What about loyalty currency? What about the miles, the points, all the issues that come in there? I know they haven't really gone too far after it yet. Have you caught wind of anything or is there anything that you're aware of? So there's, I know in the US when they defined a money service business and they were trying to catch virtual currency, it was so broad it could catch like mileage points and loyalty rewards. So to date in Canada, there's nothing that deals with loyalty except in two things. In Quebec, there was a recent consultation process on amending the Consumer Protection Act to catch loyalty. So loyalty would get put in the prepaid basket and there'd be restrictions on expiry of points and things like that. So that there was, and I know that the industry is involved and did comment on that consultation paper when it came out in, in Quebec and I'm, I've lost track. I think it was last summer. So that's the first thing. The second thing is there was a class action lawsuit. I think it's, it's in process against Aeroplan for basically terminating their program. So I think, you know, this is something that, you know, especially in Quebec where there's a really very very strong consumer advocate group. You know, you might see those sorts of issues. Uh, uh, to date, I've only heard of Quebec attempting to regulate. I haven't heard of any other jurisdiction. But, you know, if you go back to treating customers fairly and how this code is going to apply, whether it'll just be financial institutions or it'll go much broader to all kinds of service providers, um, you know, interesting to see if that will cover these sorts of programs as well, you know. We have another question from Larry Richardson, Exchange Solutions. Yeah, just a quick question. Something you touched on, I don't even think it was back in March, it might have been just initially when you touched base on the anti, uh, anti spam legislation. Um, refer a friend type program, so not necessarily social media, but where you know companies are trying to you know leverage their uh, member base to kind of uh, extend out sort of offers to their friends. Um, is that, you said that was kind of a gray area. Has that been addressed specifically in the anti uh, spam legislation? So I th I don't think it's been addressed specifically, but re you know, refer a friend, you could not, if someone refers a friend to you through email, you couldn't send them an email without having their consent, right? So you can ask the friend to send the email to the friend, but you couldn't send it directly without consent. You'd have to reach out by mail and say, hey, we have these great programs, we want to send you an email. But otherwise, if you don't have express consent, you can't. <laughs> Okay, well thank you very much.